Hello, in this recording we will talk about the kinetic theory of gases. So we start with the ideal gas law that was found experimentally through observation. How did the properties and parameters of certain sample of gases behave under different conditions? And so this summarizes the macroscopic properties of a gas, and that means properties that us humans can directly see, investigate, and measure. But what about the microscopic behavior on the atomic or molecular scale? The behavior of individual atoms and molecules. So the concepts behind the microscopic behavior is contained in the kinetic theory of gases that was developed in the 19th century. And so here's the basic tenets of the kinetic theory of gases. Gas molecules are in constant random motion. They move in straight lines until they collide. And then when the gas molecules collide with each other, the collisions are perfectly elastic. So this means that no energy is lost in the collision itself. All right, number three, gas molecules are infinitesimally small points, which is not true. Gas molecules have a volume, but in this theory, you can pretty readily get away with assuming that they are infinitesimally small and have no volume. And gas molecules do not influence each other except during a collision. So a gas molecule does not feel the effects of another gas molecule until it hits it. And so these qualitative ideas are the foundation for the kinetic theory of gases. It gives us a good picture of what gas molecules are doing on the molecular level. Now the fifth piece here is the kinetic energy involved with the translational motion of these gas molecules. So the average kinetic energy of the molecules turns out is proportional to the temperature of the gas. So in the red box here, we have the average kinetic energy for a mole of gas. The little bar on the top up here just means average, this little like bar here. And so the kinetic energy for a mole of gas is equal to 1 half mv squared. Now, this is not a v, this is actually an upsilon, and we're gonna use it to refer to average speed. That's a nuance you don't need to worry about. This is the molar mass in kilograms, because then the units will work out a lot better, and that's 1 half, okay. The molar mass and the speed is related to temperature by some constant. That's what it means to say this is proportional to temperature. And so the outcome of this is that if you have gas molecules at different temperatures, they have a different distribution of speeds. So these two plots show nitrogen molecules at 300 Kelvin and 1000 Kelvin. And on the left plot, we have how the speed behaves with temperature. And on the right plot, we have how the kinetic energy behaves with temperature. So at the lower temperature, which is the blue curve, you have a lower speed and you have a lower kinetic energy than your, say, average at the higher temperature, which has a higher kinetic energy and a higher speed. And our modern understanding of what temperature is tells us that thermal energy in a system, which we measure with temperature, the thermal energy is manifested as molecular and atomic movement, translations, vibrations, things like that, predominantly translational motions for a gas. And so this makes sense that if you have more energy, you have more translational motion for something that's hotter. Now another component of kinetic energy being equal to one half m times the speed squared is that m is the molar mass in this case. Um, so therefore, at a constant temperature, different gas molecules with different molar masses will have different speeds. And so in the plot here, we have chlorine, nitrogen, and helium gas, and the molar mass for each of the gases is listed on here as well. And so the helium, which is the smallest out of these three, has the highest average speed, and then nitrogen has, is in the middle, and then chlorine, which is the heaviest molecule, has the slowest speed. And so that kind of makes sense. For a constant amount of energy, the lighter gas molecules are gonna move faster, the heavier gas molecules move slower, and that kind of makes sense intuitively, hopefully. Another feature of these distributions is that as the average of the distribution gets higher, so for the helium out here, the spread of the distribution broadens, so it's wider in addition to its average being at a higher value. Okay, so this information we gave to you a few slides ago, 
Um, the average kinetic energy of one molar gas is one half times the molar mass times the average speed squared. And then that's equal to some constant times temperature. Well, it turns out that this constant right here is three halves times R. And R is our friend, the ideal gas constant. And so this gives us a link between the macroscopic properties of a gas, temperature, we can measure temperature really easily, which gives us the average thermal energy of the sample, and the microscopic properties of the gas, how these gas molecules are moving. And so this is a useful linkage that we can use experimentally and theoretically. Um, in these calculations, you're gonna use a different form of the ideal gas constant, however. You'll use this form, R is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And so we have to talk about why we now suddenly have a new form of the gas law constant we're gonna use. The big feature of this new gas law constant is that it's in joules per mole Kelvin. But first, let's talk about how we get there. So the gas law constant, we typically use it in this form in liters atmospheres per mole times Kelvin, but you can easily convert atmospheres to bar and get this form of it. Now we have some relationships here we can use. So one bar is 100,000 pascals, and a pascal is the SI unit of pressure because it's directly related to a Newton per meter squared, force per area, which is pressure. And so we can take this definition of a bar and just plug this number right into here. And then we can use the relationship that a liter is 0 0.001 cubic meters. So we can take this number and plug it right in here. And when we do so, well, okay, we get this form down here. And then if you compute the numbers you have jammed together here, you get 8.314. And then the units here are newtons times meters per mole Kelvin. Okay, we're not quite there. We need to use one further relationship that one joule is equal to one newton times a meter. A joule is energy, and a newton is force, and therefore it takes some energy in order to apply some force for some distance, if you think about moving physical objects around we can then replace newton meters with joules and then we get our final form of the gas law constant down here 8.314 joules per mole kelvin now we wind up using this form of the gas constant anytime we discuss energy so keep that in mind okay one last thing we do with the kinetic theory of gases is we can calculate the root mean squared speed and so let's do that let's solve for this speed and so one half times m times the average speed squared is equal to three halves rt. Okay, so this was from the equations before. Now, you can easily solve for the speed squared by just rearranging this equation. And now if you take the square root of both sides, then you have this equation here, where you take the square root of your average speed squared. And so this has a special name in science, it's called a root mean square, or RMS, which means you take a set of numbers, you square them, and then you average them, and then you take the square root. And it's just another way to define an average of a distribution of values. And so this root mean square speed, which is this epsilon RMS, is equal to three times the gas constant times temperature divided by molar mass in kilograms. And so that's what this little subscript kg is. You need to put this in kilograms, otherwise your units aren't gonna work out. The unit of a joule is defined using kilograms, and so we need to have our molar mass in kilograms so that the units all work out. Okay, so this root mean square speed is a useful thing that we can calculate about gases that tells us something about the behavior and the properties of the sample of gas. Okay, so now an example problem. Let's calculate the root mean square speed of oxygen molecules at 45 degrees C. So you'll need the ideal gas law constant, now in joules per moles times Kelvin. And then to truly understand the units, you need to know the definition of a joule in terms of its base units. And then the equation for root mean square speed is on the right. Eventually we'll need our temperature in Kelvin, so here's me converting it to Kelvin. 
And then we'll also need to know the molar mass of oxygen. And these are oxygen molecules, O2. So we need to know the molar mass of O2. And so here it is. And then we'll need the molar mass in kilograms because that'll make the units work out in the end. Okay, so we take all of these things and plug them into the equation. And now we take the definition of a joule and expand it into kilograms meters squared over seconds squared. And we'll see that the kilograms cancel, the moles cancel, the kelvins cancel, and we're left with units of meters squared divided by seconds squared underneath a square root sign. So then this gives us units of meters per second, which is a speed, so that makes perfect sense. And then our number here is 498. So the root mean square speed of oxygen at 45 Celsius is 498 meters per second. And so these are the types of calculations we can ask you to do. Again, just remember the molar mass needs to go in kilograms, and you need to use this correct form of the gas law constant. Okay, now that we know about the kinetic theory of gases, Let's go back to talking about conceptually how we can now explain the things that we already know about gases in light of this new theory. So, gases are compressible. This is because gas molecules are very small points that are separated by a lot of empty space and so that you can readily compress them. That makes sense. Boyle's law tells us that the pressure and the volume are inversely related. So if you double the pressure, you half the volume. And, all right, well, pressure is the collision rate of the gas molecules with the wall. Now that collision rate depends on how many molecules there are per a given space, and how many molecules per space, the number density, is proportional to the inverse volume. So if you have the same number of gas molecules and then you jam them into less volume, so you decrease the volume, you will have more of these gas molecules hitting every square inch of your container, and so that's going to increase the pressure. All right, Charles's law, the one that tells you that pressure is proportional to temperature. So again, pressure is related to the collision rate of the gas molecules with the wall, and now the collision rate is also proportional to the kinetic energy of the gas molecules. If the gas molecules are moving faster, they're gonna collide with the wall more frequently, and thus that will increase the pressure, assuming everything else is held constant. Avogadro's law tells us that the pressure is proportional to the number of moles of gas, and well, again, the pressure is the collision rate of the gas molecules with the wall, which is related to how many gas molecules you have in a given volume that collide with a certain area of the wall of the container. And well, if you have more gas molecules in there, then there's more collisions with the wall. And then finally, to extend this to Dalton's law of partial pressures, is we stated in the kinetic theory of gases that molecules do not attract or repel one another. And this makes sense as to why you can then separate the contributions from each gas as if the other gas didn't exist, because to a decent approximation, the behavior of gas molecules is not affected by the identity or presence of other gas molecules. One of the cool things about the ideal gas law and kinetic theory is that you can theoretically relate the two together. You can start from the kinetic theory and work your way towards the ideal gas law, knowing some basic rules of physics. And so I think that's neat, that all the various pieces of science we learn independently can work together and see how they inform one another. Okay, finally, I want to say that we're going to skip section 1311 and 1312 in this course. And I also want to say thank you for watching the video.